Hey, what's up everybody? In this video, I want to compare Tyson Foods to Hormel and see which one's a better deal. If this is your first time watching me, my name is Dan. I do a lot of stock analysis on this channel. So if you're into that kind of thing, hit that subscribe button so you can check out more videos like this one. All right, let's jump into it. Okay, so this is Tyson Foods. Here's just a snapshot of some of their brands. And these are the kind of foods that you can get from Hormel. Now, to me, one of the most interesting things about these two companies is how very different the stock market views them right now. Tyson Foods is down just about 29% for the year, giving them a price to earnings ratio of about 11.38 right now. Compare that to Hormel, who has actually gained 4% for the year, giving them a price to earnings ratio of about 26.66. They both have a market cap of about $25 billion. Given that they operate in the same industry, it's very interesting how the market is viewing each of them. So here's Tyson's revenue by segment. You can see they just break it down into different kind of meats. You got 19% prepared foods, 4% other, and the rest of it is a bunch of different kind of meats. Compare that to Hormel, who breaks it down very differently. You've got Jenny O Turkey store there, international and other grocery products, and the bulk of it being refrigerated foods. This does make it hard to compare the two, at least on that basis. Now, as far as geography, both of them are close to 100% based in the U.S. Let's compare their balance sheet. So Tyson is more highly levered compared to Hormel. You can, when you look at the liabilities to assets ratio. So we're gonna be giving Tyson a little discount there. As far as liquidity, Hormel is also in significantly better shape. When you look at their current ratio, Hormel's got 2.38. So that means current assets are equal to 2.38 times the current liabilities. Tyson's not in bad shape there with 1.86. Remember, we want at least a one there. Uh, but Hormel's clearly in better shape. The quick ratio echoes that. If you don't know any of these formulas, check them out in the description below. But essentially, current ratio and quick ratio look at liquidity. Interest coverage ratio tells you, you know, out of all the money you earn, how, mu how many times can you cover your interest expense? And again, for Hormel, they're in excellent shape, 54 times. Uh, for Tyson, it's close to eight. Uh, and again, Tyson's not in terrible shape here, but Hormel's clearly healthier. Hormel has about 17% of their assets or cash. That's a lot better than Tyson, although not very efficient. You know, you want them to put that capital to use. Inventory is about the same. And Tyson has more of a commitment to long-term assets, which, you know, we'll have to look at their turnover, but that could hurt them. You know, they could be using too many assets to generate their revenues. So Hormel is the clear winner on the balance sheet. Okay, so let's break down the return on equity being the most important measure of profitability from a stockholder perspective. Let's break that down into its three parts, net income margin, asset turnover, and the equity multiplier. This is called a DuPont analysis. Now, they both have pretty similar ROEs, averaging you know around 15% for the past year. And you can see that Tyson's has been higher in the past, but overall, you know, anywhere from 15 to 18% seems pretty normal for them. Now, how do they get there? That's very important to look at. One thing you can see right away with the equity multiplier, Tyson's high, higher leverage. So although the ROE turns out to be the same in the most recent year, you much prefer Hormel's because they're not using leverage to get there. The real difference here is in net income margin. This is one of the key parts of return on equity. For every dollar of sales, how much do you make in profit? And the answer for Tyson appears to be about five cents. Now it's bounced around, but it, it looks to be around five cents. Now for Hormel, it's the opposite. I mean, they make just about 10 cents for every dollar sales they have on average. That's twice as good. The asset turnovers between the two companies are not so different. And so, you know, the primary thing driving it here is net income margin. 
So Hormel is the clear winner in terms of how they make their profitability. So here I'm looking at total revenues for Tyson over time and millions of dollars. And they're really not growing much. So, you know, that's something we have to look at when we forecast the future. I would not expect them to be growing at a very high rate. Uh, here is Hormel. Here's their revenue over time. And I got to say, it's pretty much the same. There's not a lot of growth going on with either of these two companies. One thing that is attractive about both companies is their stability relative to other companies out there. They do sell food. That's something people are going to be needing. And so given their stability, it's not surprising that they're both pretty nice dividend payers and they tend to raise their dividend. Tyson Foods has managed to grow their dividend every year for the past nine years. Their most recent five-year dividend growth rate is 36.59%, pretty sick. Despite this incredible growth rate, their current dividend is yielding 2.75% and it's only 31% payout ratio. What that means is, out of all the money they generate this year, they only paid 31% of it out as a dividend. That means they could pretty well afford to keep paying it and raising it. Let's compare to Hormel. Hormel has been growing their dividend for 54 years. The most recent five-year growth rate is 16%. They're yielding a little bit worse here, 2.08%. And I gotta say, the payout ratio is significantly worse. It's still a nice payout ratio, okay? It's not that, you know, it's not like the dividend is in great danger or anything. But it is a lot higher compared to Tyson Foods. Okay, so to recap so far, Hormel Foods definitely has the better balance sheet. They are a safer investment as far as that goes. Their profitability, Hormel is the clear winner. Their margins are better, and being that they're less highly leveraged, that makes their return on equity all the more impressive compared to Tyson. That being said, both companies seem like sound investments right now. Uh, it's really going to depend on how much we're paying to, compared to how much we're going to get. That's, that's the crux of investment. So at this point in the video, I want to use an intrinsic valuation model to try and figure out a fair value for both companies. Okay, so I'll be using a free cash flow to equity model to value both Tyson and Hormel. A few assumptions in this model. Number one. How much is each company going to be able to grow their earnings by over the next five years? The answer is pretty easy in this case. As you saw from the growth graphs that I put up, neither company is really in a growth phase. And when I look at the analyst forecast, they only confirm this. So we're going to say they can grow their earnings anywhere from 1% to 5% a year for the next five years. Very modest growth rate. After that point in time, we will assume they can only grow 1%. Just keep up with inflation. Just increase their prices a little bit every year. The next thing we have to assume is a discount rate. Given everything I've seen so far on their balance sheets, and when I look at the competitiveness of their industry, I think you need at least a 6% discount rate, maybe 7%. Uh, anything beyond that seems a little high to me. If anything, give Tyson a little bit higher of a discount rate for their worst balance sheet. So with that in mind, let's look at what each company is worth under these assumptions. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a valuation matrix for Tyson Foods. Um, each cell is the fair value of their stock under two assumptions. Number one, what's the discount rate you want to use? And number two, what is the growth rate in the free cash flow to equity? So for example, if I look at a cell like this one right here, this cell means that if the company uses a 7% discount rate and they're able to grow at 2% a year for the next five years, their stock would be worth $71.57 today. That's the fair value of it. Another way of interpreting this whole matrix is to say, look, I need an 8% return on my investment. And I think the company is going to grow at 4% a year. If that's the case, then I look at this cell right here and that says, if I want to give that 8% return, I can't pay more than this much, $66.34. Now, overall, when you look at everything, is Tyson a good deal? Depends on which cell you're looking at. So for me, the most likely cell would be somewhere in this, this row right here. I think 7% is the right discount rate for Tyson. 
And I think, you know, if you want to be conservative, 2% growth a year, you know, maybe this cell right here, maybe this one right here. Either way, it's higher than what the stock is selling for right now. So it looks to be a good deal. And for more on that, check out the matrix below, which shows you how good of a deal it would be. So if it's in green, that tells you it's a discount by however much percent. And if it's red, that means it's overpriced under those assumptions. So overall, Tyson has more good scenarios than bad. And the good ones are a lot better than the bad ones. So, so for example, in the most optimistic scenario, the stock would be undervalued by 57.4%. And the worst case, it's overvalued by about 20%. Let's compare to Hormel. Now for Hormel, I have plugged in slightly higher growth rates because the analysts have a slightly higher estimate of their growth rate over the next five years. But look guys, long story short, I won't spend a lot of time on this because Hormel looks to be overvalued under pretty much any assumption here. Uh, as you can see in the matrix below, it's all red, it's all overvalued. I mean, how much do they have to grow by to make it a good deal? Let's plug in some numbers here. 8%, anywhere, you know, even 11% growth rate is not a good deal. And there's no way this company is going to grow 11% for the next five years. So even though Hormel seems to be the better company, it is not the better investment right now. Last piece of information is insider trading. Academic research shows that insiders generally know more than outsiders about the company's near-term prospects. So we like to look at what the insiders are doing. And for Tyson, it's actually a lot more insiders buying compared to selling shares right now. Let's look at the number of shares involved. So in the past three months, you've got over 262,000 shares bought compared to 47,000 shares sold. This tells me that insiders believe Tyson is undervalued. So comparing to Hormel Foods, they also have a lot of insiders buying, especially the last three months. You've got 23 purchases, one sale. Uh, if you look at the number of shares involved, the number of shares bought absolutely dwarfs the number of shares sold there. So very interesting that for both companies, the insiders believe that they are undervalued. Okay, so here is my conclusion. The first point I want to make in the conclusion is to hit that like button. It helps me a lot. Okay, but seriously, guys, what I would say here is Hormel is clearly the superior company, but the much worse investment. So I love Hormel's profitability. Their balance sheet is definitely a little bit better compared to Tyson. But if you look at the way they're priced right now and you plug in some very plausible growth rate numbers and reasonable discount rates, Hormel is a bad deal under almost any scenario you look at. They'd have to grow at 20% per year for the next five years to even be considered a good deal. So you're not really going to be making money with Hormel Foods. Now, the insider trading data for Hormel was very positive, and that is a little puzzling, uh, but I'm not going to buy based on that alone. If I'm going to buy an individual stock, I want to have almost all of the indicators pointing in the same direction, saying buy. And if that's the case, I'll buy. Otherwise, I'll just pass on it. There's no penalty for passing on an investment, guys. So, the, you know... Don't buy just because of one reason or two reasons. Make sure you have all indicators pointing buy and then buy it. Now, as far as Tyson, I don't think it's a screaming buy. You know, when you look at that matrix, you look at the insider trading. It's definitely a buy recommendation, but it really depends on your current portfolio. You know, how heavily weighted are you in a sector like that, in the food sector? You know, how heavily weighted are you in equities? I could see adding it to a lot of your portfolios but it would definitely depend on your portfolio. And so it's a, a buy, but not a screaming buy recommendation. That's just my thought on that. 